everyone. Welcome to the third edition of the Coffee Microcaps Fund Manager interview series. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Tony Hansen from EGP Capital. Tony, welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Just uh, in case anybody's not familiar with you, um, can you give a quick overview of um, EGP Capital for, uh, as I said, people who, who might not be familiar with the uh, the fund at this point? Sure, well, EGP started in uh, the fund, the original fund started in 2011, was called Eternal Growth Partners, and which is the way for a bunch of my friends and family to pull capital together. It was formalized into a trust structure in 2017. And um, we've been running in that structure ever, ever since. The, uh, I guess the um, marketing pitch for my fund is, or the point of difference is that we don't charge a, uh, management fee and we only earn a fee if we outperform the ASX 200, which we've had a little trouble doing for the last few years, but uh, is to uh, 2021 being better in that regard. But the, um, so that's the sort of, um, I guess, the point of difference of our fund is that if we don't beat the index, then you don't have to pay us a fee, So, uh, which is pretty uncommon in the industry. And uh, yeah, just maybe to give people, because uh, I'm fairly familiar with it, um, you're completely uh, unconstrained i guess you know but you're not trying to mirror the index it's like you can go large cap mid cap small cap micro cap but you, i i think yeah. it's generally found yeah, better we are, we, are completely unconstrained. we are completely unconstrained but uh, in practical terms i consider myself a, a smaller micro cap manager the median market cap at um at the end of November, the last report I published from memory was about 104 million. So if you line our, um, our stocks up from largest to smallest, the 50th percentile is right in that 100 million mark, which is sort of the sweet spot in micro cap I think you define it as up to 200 million. Is that right? Uh, yeah, anything under 300. So I, 300. yeah. All right. Well, I'd say probably, we'd estimate probably 80% of our portfolio would fall within, within the micro cap. And then you have Almost everything else we own at one stage or when we started owning it was a micro cap and you know, through performance they get to be, um, they pop into the small cap um, range. So the largest stock we own is a $1.8 billion company, but it was a $50 million company when I first bought it in 2012. Yeah. 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 1.8 billion, you're kind of into solidly small cap land there. Um, but let's uh, jump into the first one that we're going to talk about today. Um, Let's start with, with SmartPay. Just maybe give people uh, an overview of, of SmartPay. I mean, how do these guys make their money? Well, they're a uh, payment terminals business. They operate in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand is their most mature business. They're quite a dominant, well, not a dominant player, but they're one of the dominant players in the, in the New Zealand market. But the New Zealand business is... Uh, not as attractive of a business as the Australian business. The New Zealand business is a terminal rentals business, so they just simply rent terminals to um, mostly small and medium enterprise um, and the taxi industry and various sort of um, other verticals like that. That business is neither growing nor shrinking and it's just sort of been chugging along and they've sort of effectively used that as a, as a source of cash to grow the Australian business. The Australian business is also, um, it's the same, it's a, it's a terminals business, but it's Primarily, actually, rather than being a, a, a terminal rental business, they've actually got an acquiring license in Australia, which enables them to um, to uh, you know, have the back end, and so they make a little bit of extra revenue out of, out of the um, out of their terminals in Australia, which is a really attractive business model for them to go into. I guess. So basically, every time you swipe your card at a Seven Eleven or in a taxi or um, you know. Any of those, any of those kind of retail outlets, and um, they're clipping a small fee on the way through. Yeah, well, well, they, they do actually have a, um, a terminal rental product in Australia, but it's not um, widely used. Their main product in Australia is called um, Smart Charge, and, and, and it, it's actually like you say. So the terminal is free to the um, to, to the, um, the business provided they hit certain revenue uh, thresholds. And uh, once they hit that, and so, and as you say, exactly, they, the, the customer swipes their card and if it was a $100 um, payment, 
Um, it might I think it's usually about a 1.2% fee. So if the dollar twenty comes in, they pay away a little bit to um, to switching to switching and to Visa and or whoever the underlying rails are, and then the rest they get to keep them. Um, you know, the model is looking very, very attractive and we're getting some pretty pretty impressive growth. Okay. And then I guess let's zoom out a bit for the kind of investment thesis from from your point of view, you know. What's the kind of, um, I guess, you know, attraction for you to like, you know, put this into the portfolio and, you know, talk us through why you, why you were uh, attracted to SmartPay? Okay, so we've owned SmartPay. I think I probably first put SmartPay shares into the fund in around 2016. I probably should have actually gone and uh, just double checked on that before I did the interview, but I, I'm going to say it was probably in late 2016. I first started buying some SmartPay shares. I spoke to the CEO at the time, Brad, Bradley uh, Gertis, and thought that what he was doing was interesting. They they recently got that acquiring license in Australia, which was going to enable them to create that business. and. The stock looked interesting. I bought a sort of a smallish position, but it wasn't until about, um, I'm going to say it's probably about 18 months ago when you could really start to see traction was taking hold in that business. And I really built, built that up to a meaningful um, position in the fund. And um, I think it's probably our third or fourth largest holding now. So it's, it's grown to be, you know, we've got probably about a six to seven percent, six and a half percent weight or something like that in the fund. So it's quite a meaningful position for us. And I know they were in the process of selling the New Zealand business and then COVID hit and a whole lot of um, delays ensued around that. Just give me, just give us an update on where they are with that process on the New Zealand business. So, I mean, I don't know how deep you want to go into the sort of valuation thesis, but effectively this is how I think of it, is that the market cap is roughly um, 150 million or thereabouts at the moment. They were offered 70 million by Verifone. So Verifone are, are owned by private equity. Verifone make terminals and, and they're, they were attracted to the New Zealand business because effectively they could pay what was a pretty handsome multiple for the business, plug it into theirs. And because they get, um, they've got the whole vertical stitched up at that point. So it's, it's more valuable to, to them than it is to, to smart pay. And then, as you say, COVID came along and, and the deal fell over. Well, I think what actually happened is they tried to use COVID as a way to sort of try and um, tweak the price a little bit. And the board know how valuable the asset um, is. And so they said no sensibly. So but the, way I, the way I think about it is that at some stage, someone, maybe Verifone or one of the other players, will come and probably have another go at New Zealand business. So I sort of think of the Australian business as an 80 million um, ish market cap business, which you know, has just a really, really impressive growth runway there. There's only one real competitor, um, according to me, in, in the market, that's Tyro. And you can go and look at Tyro's accounts for a comparison if you want to sort of do a like for like. The other competitors, obviously, are the big four banks and they're, they're very slow moving and not hard to outcompete. So, and, 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 and I think that both Tyro and SmartPay will have plenty of fun over the next few years cutting their grass. So I, I guess it's not so much back to square one, but it's um, back to where uh, you originally invested. The New Zealand business, a good business, it's ticking along and it's helped funding growth in the in the Australian business. With you've got the potential for um, uh, Verifone or other suitors to come back in at a later stage. And in terms of risks around smart pay, I mean, yeah, is it that the banks wake up one day and they say, look? You know, we're not happy with like these guys uh, stealing a march on us, or is it, you know, Tyro, I know, have probably a much bigger balance sheet that they could, you know, do aggressive pricing and kind of, you know, force market out of, out of the way in terms of uh, new customers. You know, what, what, what has the risks or some of the risks you see around smart pay? Well, I think the, the key risk is probably what, what you talked about um, you know, major players with deep pockets decided that they're not just going to let um, uh, let smart pay just grind away and just take their market. But in terms of, I'm pretty sure the, the, um, there's 1.2 million terminals, I think, in, in Australia. And at the moment, um, 
I'd actually, can I share the screen? Is that is that something that you usually do in this? No, but we 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 can definitely do it. Uh, oh, because no, only um, oh, just a second now you've got it disabled. That's all right. Well, I tell tell your um. Just give me one second there. I was going to say I'll, I'll, I'll tell your um. It doesn't have to be a shared screen. But there's a there's a um graph that the company um. You can share it now, Tony. Oh, okay. Well, so th this is, can you see that? Um, yeah, the Australian earning revenues uh, slide. So th this, this graph, um, the company uh, publish almost every time they do a market update. And so you can see um, COVID very clearly in that. You can see the lovely, lovely growth trajectory the business was on. You can see COVID comes along and a bunch of businesses shut down. And then you can see it coming back. But how I think about it, so they added 487 terminals in October. Um, there was some some of um, you know that would be Victorian terminals coming back on, and, and, and the rest would be new terminals. Maybe about 350 new terminals, which implies about 4,000 some um, terminals and annual growth. Now that's out of a market of 1.2 million. Honestly, the banks aren't even going to notice it. Pyro will notice it a little bit because they're trying to grow as well. But I, I just, as far as the risk goes, um, um, I, I can stop sharing that now. It's just to show you and this this graph here. I would I would say to your um, to your listeners or your um, viewers it is is a, is the simplest way of sort of trying to project what the value of the business is, and you, and you get a, get a look at it every few months, and, and you can sort of make your own projections about whether it keeps on that trajectory, whether, it's, whether the trajectory improves or whether it declines. And, and that's sort of the simplest way to um, value the business. Are they, the, you know, trying to target, you know, particularly industry verticals, you know, where that's like taxis or convenience stores or, you know, or, or particular states, are they, you know, just trying to pick up uh, new customers, you know, wh wherever that might be, whether it's, New South Wales or WA or taxi industry or a 7-Eleven? Uh, well, they, you know, they're, they're a little bit cagey about telling, um, um, you know, tell, telling, uh, I guess, the market exactly um, what um, verticals they're going after. But in simple terms, what they've said, the most attractive verticals for the business are those that have a relatively high ticket price. So, um, so you know, the um, a coffee shop where, you, where your average you know, um, swipe is maybe $10 is not as attractive as, say, a mechanic where your average swipe is you know, $250 or $300 yeah. or something like that. Um, so I'm just going to quickly try and stop sharing the screen there. Okay. Oh, there we are. It's on the other side. Stop. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Go back now. But, so how I think about valuation just just quickly, and, and this this I think will help your um your, your um viewership is so they added about I want to say 350 terminals in um in October, and I think that they can roughly maintain that one. Like advertising is quite cheap at the moment; they've got very very good in, inbound flow. At um and, and the margin is very high on that. So you could see on that graph that they did. Um, I don't know, I want to say about 1.6 million of um, monthly revenue in October. If you multiply that by 12, it's about 90 million. So you can annualize the run rate and sort of figure out the, the run rate that the business is on. Um, but in simple terms, the way I think about it is at 4,200 terminals, based on that that 1. Point, uh, what did I say? 1.6 million. Uh, you've got roughly 3,700 dollars a, a month uh, per terminal. Multiply that by how many terminals you think you can add, and you get an idea of how much revenue they can add. My view is that the profit margin is around about a 55% debit margin, 40% at the bottom, 55% at the top. So you can sort of say that some, somewhere between seven and nine million of debit now that business is capable of adding every year. And you're paying, if you deduct the, the 70 million for the New Zealand business, um, you're paying 80 million for that. Now that business would be worth 80 million just on that. EBITDA alone, but that's how much EBITDA it can add every year, which gives you an idea of why I think it's a really valuable business. So as long as they maintain that sort of trajectory, effectively, I think that they can add what the equivalent of what the Australian market cap is 
almost 50 years, which is why I find that you know, quite one of our largest holdings. It's a very attractive value. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the, the, the second one now, which is uh, National Tire. Um, probably not one that would jump out uh, at you um, as a you know, something that I would look at anyway, I think maybe, maybe for most people, it's, you know, pretty standard business, but um, just, yeah, just give a bit of a background on, on, on what they do for anybody that, that doesn't know, how, how do these guys make their money? The National Tire are a, um, are a distributor of tires, a very, very simple business, a proper old school value um, business. And the reason why I'm excited about it is, is actually, they just recently made a, a very, substantial acquisition a company called ties for you which really the, the revenue base of the acquired business is larger than the revenue base of national tire at the moment so it really it's been a step change in the business and um effectively yeah, it's a hundred million market at the um the national tire business they've now got between you know, maybe 450 to 500 million uh, revenue run rate so they've got a um, a huge pool of revenue on which if they can just reduce their duplicated costs by, by combining those businesses together, you should get an enormous, um, an enormous uplift in the earnings of the business. You now, distribution businesses, I talked earlier about um, my largest holding, which I said is worth about $1.8 billion. It was worth $50 million when I acquired it eight years ago. And the thing on, it's a distribution business. And the reason I like distribution businesses is because as you add revenues with a relatively fixed cost, base and their distribution footprint, um, the operating leverage that those businesses exhibit is, is quite impressive. And I mean, I don't know how deep in the weeds you want to get on, on valuation, but their, their last um, update, they said the midpoint estimate of their first half is uh, 12 million, sort of annualizes to 24 million, um, 100 million market cap. My estimate is that by, the, by June 30th, their debt will be extinguished that they use to acquire the business. So basically, you're paying four times um, EBITDA. EBITDA. Now, the business, in my view, is not a, you know, it's not the world's best business. It's never going to trade at 10 or 12 or 15 times EBITDA, EBITDA but I think it's probably a six to seven times um, EBITDA, EBITDA business. So six times implies a 50% uplift effectively. Yeah. But as far as evaluate, that's not the reason I'm excited. You know, no one's really going um, going around looking to make um, you know, a 50% uplift. What you're looking for is a little bit more, I always say, you're looking for a little extra mustard on the hot dog. And the mustard on this hot dog, um, in simple terms, is that they've currently got a, a, um, a warehouse footprint that runs to 31, 31 tire distribution centers. And so Peter Ludum, the uh, CEO, thinks that over the course of about 18 months, they can uh, contract that into about 15 and really um, pull a lot of costs out of the business. And um, you know, to, cut, to get it to sort of 10 tax, my view is that um, they can probably get that business to about a 7.5% EBITDA margin, which on 500 million in revenue is about 37.5 um, million. So basically, the, I think the multiple on the current earnings is about 50 it needs to go up 50% to re re reflect fair, but then the earnings of the business, I think, can also rise 50%. So when you multiply those through, and I think you've got quite an attractive... Um, and the tire for you acquisition, are they, you know, trying to become a bit more vertically integrated in the chain? They've, you know, bought one of their main retail customers and they've got the distribution business that's supplying them and... You know a whole host of other uh, tire retailers, Bob Jane, T Marts, and, and the like. Yeah, well, the, the thing that's attractive about the acquisition is that there is actually not all that much crossover in the in the types of tires that they, that they sell. You know, the um, the tires for you business was selling a lot more, um, you know, in, into um, the transportation industry, so a lot more bus and truck tires and that sort of thing, whereas um. National Tire itself was more of a specialist in four-wheel drive tires. That was their focus. And um, uh, Tires View um, does um, you know, all-terrain vehicles like, uh, what do you call it, like um, you know, um, four-wheelers and things like this. And so they've actually really substantially increased the, the range of products that, that they sell. And so 
part of the thesis, obviously, would be, and none of that's built into what I talked about valuation earlier, but part of the thesis would be that they could start to sell that range of tyres into their customers and their range of tyres into the other customers. So there's what, you, you know, what would be described by um, a CEO as revenue synergies. Thankfully, I've never heard Peter Lederman use that um, expression, but yeah, that, that's, that's probably the, the hidden potential of, of, that, um, of the acquisition as well. And I mean, distribution businesses, um, the, the other, I guess the risk on the other side is that uh, they generally do come with fixed cost bases. As you say, you know, you need like warehousing and, you know, there's a lot, you know, you're holding a lot of stock. Um, so if, if you don't get the sales and, you know, the margins are, you know, we're not talking a, a SaaS based business here in terms of margins, you know, yeah, like, there, there, there's not a lot of wiggle room a lot of the time. Um, so would that be one of the key risks is, you know, that the, the sales don't come through that they're expecting or is there, so, is there something else that kind of keeps you half awake at night? I think the sales are probably pretty reliable. Um, you know, you'll get, you'll get uh, potentially you could get a more moderate growth or slight contraction in sales. But if, if the simplest way to look at the risks of this business to actually look at um, the national fire IPO and how the business was traveling and then the next few years. And what you had was an Australian dollar that went from somewhere above a dollar to down below 70 cents. Um, and obviously that put a lot of pressure on, on, on the margins. And, and then you had some, um, well, what you had, part of it was to do with uh, when uh, President Trump put tariffs on, on Chinese products into the US. And so what a lot of the Chinese manufactured tires were for were places that they could start to send their products that didn't have the tariffs. So they, they um, effectively, you know, we don't want to accuse anyone of dumping, but they were sort of dumping product um, into Australia effectively with sort of crimp margins. There was a lot of uh, buy a free, get one free type um, offers at the, the major tire houses. For, so yeah, there are definitely risks in terms of that. You know, when you're talking about some very, very big multinational global businesses between Australia, the relatively small market, and so they might behave irrationally for a period. Um, and on the other side of that, I think that there's a there's a number of tailwinds that I haven't talked about within Australia. Almost everyone I know when I talk to um, talk to them about what they're doing over the Christmas break, everyone's going for a long drive abroad. I spoke to one of my um, one of my investors this morning, a Sydney-based investor, was driving down to Melbourne and then catching a ferry with his car to Tasmania. Um, and, and I've spoken to a number of people that are doing um, pretty major driving trips like that because of the. Um, so that's a that's going to be a short-term fill-up, I think, for their earnings as well. Yeah, well, as you said, the short-term fill-up they can uh, use that to 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 pay down the debt. And um, you know, take a win when you can get a win. Um. And in terms of broadening their product offering, you know, can they get, you know, more uh, brands or, you know, different types of tires on board? Are they actively seeking, you know, more distribution licenses in Australia or do they want to stay in, in the kind of niche that they built for themselves? Uh, I, I think that over time they'll probably widen their product range um, you know, in incrementally, it won't be like other distributors that are sort of just constantly adding new revenue lines into their footprint. It's probably not as attractive as a distribution business in that regard. But yes, yeah, certainly they can. There are still the, the pool of um, potential acquisitions in the in the in the um, independent car market is is still pretty large. I think this this is probably the most attractive significant acquisition out there but there's, there's certainly a number of other um what you might call tucking acquisitions that they potentially do over the next few years that could, could be wonderful to create you know as i say um, there's so much duplicated um footprint distribution footprint the other thing that i really didn't go through in terms of um valuation is you know, the bigger you get you start to go to your um your transport company and say, all right, we were sending you know, this many loads through your life, you know, so you know, two and a half times that many we want a better price. And, and so there's a lot you can do in terms of, you know, scale is a real benefit in a, in a distribution business. No, 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 scale is, is everything. Just look at Coca-Cola. It's the world's largest yeah. distribution company. It's not a, it's not a drinks company. No, exactly. And, and, and you know, the, if they can incrementally add some fucking revenue at, um, at you know, I, I talked about, by the way, a seven and a half percent EBITDA margin. This business, um, 
pre-IPO and for the first couple of years post-IPO was doing 11 or 12 percent. Um, I think it might have been done 13 or 14 percent a couple of the real hot years. So I mean there, there's potential upside to that as well although, although the um, because they were doing a lot of the ties for your acquisition was doing a lot more sort of wholesaling or in, into um, more competitive markets like, um, um, like buses and this sort of thing. The margins might never get back to that level but certainly there's upside risk to that. To that yeah. um, and I mean the strength we've seen the Aussie dollar is a, is a is a little bit of a tailwind for them as well. Going you know going the other way for the first time in a long time. Well, the other the other thing from a um, from a portfolio management viewpoint, I don't know how, how much we probably talked about this in the first couple of um, um, meetings. But you need to own different things for different reasons. If all you own are SAT stocks and SAT stocks go out of favour then you really struggle. If all you own are deep value stocks and deep values out of favor like it has been for the last few years, then you're going to have a very, very tough period. But if you own, and these two businesses couldn't be, you know, well, they could be a little bit more different. I suppose the SaaS business could be more different from National Tire than Smart. But they're quite different businesses. And one of the things that I think that your, your, your uh, viewers should think about when they construct their portfolio is only different things for different reasons. Um, so, um, and that's why I thought two very different businesses that are both um, in that hundred to hundred and fifty million dollar range might be interesting to sort of look yeah. at. Think about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, they're yeah, totally different industries. They've got their you know own different drivers, and um, yeah, it's good to. I think yeah, you can, you yeah, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes get caught up and say, oh, I'm diversified because they've got like twenty five stocks. But if you drill back down into them, you'll find that. You know, the probably twenty to twenty-five are kind of highly correlated, as you say. They're all in a value bucket, or all in a technology bucket, or so you think you're diversified just by the sheer number of stocks you have in your portfolio. But it actually, you know, might mightn't hold true um, when you uh, you know put the microscope over each one of them every now and again. Tony, that was great. Thank you so much. If people want to get in touch with you or find out more about the fund, um, you know, what's the best way to to get in touch with you? Well, for um, the sort of valuation nerds at the moment, I'm, I'm doing in my um, in, in my um, monthly reports a series um, called um, "In Search of Eleven Figures," which is is trying to think a long way out about how businesses might get to be ten billion dollar businesses. So, you know, if, I'm assuming that most of the people who, who watch your show here are sort of trying to be self-taught investors, and um, you know, I, I think. My last month's um, update was on a company called Redbubble, which is again very different to the two stocks we talked about today. So my recommendation to your investors, if they're if they're into um, sort of um, learning about how to value businesses, is to go and sign up for that newsletter on my website at egpcapital.com.au. If they're interested in the fund, they're welcome to talk about that. But a big part of what I like to do, I, I just want to see more investors investing more smartly out there. So I don't care if I'm investing my fund, but if you if you want to learn about investing. Have a look at the news at the newsletter. Okay, great. Thanks, Tony.